Hi, Jeff Curry here, just welcoming you to the um, second part of our six part series, um, the Siemens seminar series, um, combined with RAINS, produced to um, close the gap on CPD and continuing education opportunities um, during the COVID crisis, where a lot of the conferences and, and other opportunities have been cancelled. So, this is part one. Um, of the second part. So uh, we're going to start with um, Professor Andre Garu from Stanford University talking about PET MRI in oncology um, and other killer apps. Um, and we really look forward to his insights. Uh, today we're going to talk about PET MRI in oncology and possible other killer apps. PET MRI has been around for a number of years. The first prototypes were in small animal uh, models more than a decade ago. Uh, then there was a brain insert um, built by Siemens and installed at MGH. Then um, there were actual whole body PET MR scanners. And we're going to go over the design and we're going to go over what I think are good applications and uh, what may be even better ones in the future. So PET-CT versus PET-MR, when do you use one versus when do you use the other? I think that in many applications, PET-CT is a winner, mainly because of the simplicity of the protocol. Imaging can be done very fast. But there are definitely indications like head and neck and pelvis and a few others where PET-MR plays a significant role. And I hope to convince you of that by the end of this talk. This is the inside of a standard PET-CT. So the CT is not seen, but these are the PET detectors. So these are the ring of several thousands of these put together with the cooling and everything else. So you can imagine it's pretty difficult to put all this inside a magnetic field. So there are a few approaches as to how to, to create a PET MR um, without uh, having to put all of this inside the, the, inside the magnet. And the one that made it to the clinic is this Philips PET MR, which is a PET on the left and an MR on the right uh, with a table shuttling between the two. So this is definitely not simultaneous and it requires a large footprint and only a few were sold. GE had a, an interesting step in between where they had a PET CT in a room next to an MR and the table can be moved with the patient immobilized between the PET CT and the MR. So Obviously, neither of these are viable solutions for simultaneous PET-MR, so they, they are no longer used for a number of years now. Um, this is the original paper showing the performance of the Philips PET-MR that was at least on par with Philips PET-CT. But as I said, um, I'm not even sure that Philips is still selling this. The first truly simultaneous PET-MR was the Siemens Biograph MMR. Uh, built on a 3T MR with a PET that instead of photomultiplier tubes was using avalanche photodiodes. So you can put this avalanche photodiodes inside the magnet, inside the body coil, uh, shield them well, and then send the signal out through fiber optics and do the reconstruction outside the scanner. So these avalanche photodiodes are good. Um, however, they do not allow for time of flight. And time of flight is an important um, characteristic of modern scanners because it's allowed, it allows uh, for the placement of the signal in a smaller area uh, than um, if you don't have time of flight. The, M the magnet uh, was a prior generation um, magnet um, and there was no further development after uh, this one was installed. There are about 200 of these installed worldwide. And this is the first paper, the first one was um, came out from um, uh, Munich, from Technical University Munich, and they compared with state-of-the-art PET CT. And again, at least as good performance, if not better um, than the PET CT. This is the GE-built PET MR, uh, the GE Cigna. This one, instead of avalanche photodiode, uses silicon photomultipliers. Um, they can also be placed inside a magnet, and they allow for time of flight. They also have very high sensitivity. This is our own measurement done by Craig Levine, uh, 21 counts per second per kilo becquerel, which is three or four times higher than what you expect from a standard PET using photomultiplier tubes. And the performance of the 3TMR uh, was not compromised 
uh, when you have the PET installed. So these are the couple of tests that were done by Craig um, and Gary Glover on the MR side, and you can see that the performance was not affected either by the PET on the MR or the MR on the PET. And this is a video showing how this is built inside. So you need some shielding. These are the alloy so crystals, and these are the silicone photomultipliers uh, that are actually uh, replacing um, the actual tubes that were amplifying the current. So here the light is turning to current directly. And these are put together in five modules. You have cooling water on one side. They need to stay within one degree of temperature fluctuations, otherwise they can have altered signal. They placed inside a um, um, magnet. And in fact, you can turn a wide bore 750 magnet into a PET MR if you choose to buy the MR first and then to, to buy the PET ring. So this makes it sound very easy, but we were intimately associated with the development of this scanner and it was upwards of $100 million to get it built. The first one was installed here um, in December 2013, so we have quite a bit of experience with it. Um, first one worldwide and it was followed by the one in the neuroscience building at Hoover II and then the one at LPCH uh, in 2017. So this is the uh, 3T Y-bore um, magnet uh, at Lucas after the plastic covers were removed. And we didn't know how this will turn out to be a PET MR, but this is when the PET insert arrived. And this is when it was prepared to be inserted inside the magnet and you see all of these Red tubes are um, cold tubes. Uh, the blue ones are the cold water, the chill water, and the red ones are the warm water coming off of the detector. And these are all fiber optics taking the signal back to the computers for processing. So we were not very sure that this would be a great PMR, but we were convinced that we got our hands on a very expensive sprinkler system with all these tubes here, and we were horrified of what would happen if there's a leak. It turns out that there are sensors for humidity inside, and so far we did not have any water leaks inside the, any of the three magnets that we have installed um, so far. And this is how it looks like when fully assembled. Um, we scanned the first patient in January 2014. Uh, this is used for research only, and there are several research protocols um, that I'm happy to discuss with you on another occasion, but it's a very successful program uh, and it led to multiple protocols being funded by industry and extramoral um, sources. Um, this was the first publication that came out comparing the PET-CT with PET-MR with a variety of all comers. Patients were referred for PET-CT. They would get their PET-CT here in nuclear medicine at that time the standard PET-CT, not the digital, and then they were transferred over to Lucas to get a PET-MR. Um, and we, we found out that uh, with PET-MR we were able to find more lymph nodes in five patients, more lung nodules surprisingly in three patients, um, and overall there was not a single lesion that was seen on PET-CT that was not seen on PET-MR. How much was this a combination of if you do FDG, the longer you wait, the more cancer lesions you're going to see versus the superior technology of the PET in PET-MR probably a combination of both. We're also learning that this exam is being longer, on average 45 minutes. There were MR motion artifacts in quite a number of patients, seven of the 52 that we first looked at. The uptake was higher at all times with PET-MR than with PET-CT, and that shows a pretty good correlation of SUV measurements between the PET-MR and PET-CT. If you want to take out the variability, you do a background ratio of in this case, liver or cerebellum. Both liver and cerebellum have relatively stable FDG uptake over time, and you see that this is um, linear and pretty good correlation as well. So the measurements that we obtained with PET-MR were higher than with PET-CT. Again, how much is the fact that we waited longer versus the fact that um, the, the PET in PET-MR is better? Probably a combination. This was the first patient ever imaged outside the factory on a Cigna PET-MR. And you can see PET-CT here on the left, PET-MR in red, and the image quality immediately was noticeably better. There were things that needed some improvement on MR, particularly when pasting together whole body series. This is another example, patient with lymphoma with several 
nodules in the anterior medial sternum lymph nodes, rather, and then you can see more uh, with the PET from PET-MR. And also, we notice right away that we see organs with higher definition, like the spinal cord, which is the arrowhead there, that you don't see with PET-CT, with standard PET-CT, just because um, of the superior image quality. This was a head and neck patient with one lymph node seen on PET-CT, but definitely more lymph nodes seen with PET-MR. And you see this is almost actually more than three hours after injection. So um, we also figure out relatively quickly that with the superior detectors in PET-MR, you can inject uh, less radioactivity than you do with PET-CT. So to me, the logical step in deciding where to use PET-MR clinically is to look at the NCCN guidelines and figure out when patients need MR and PET-CT and the CT is not adding much. Those patients will benefit from getting combined PET-MR, if anything, because they only need one appointment as opposed to multiple appointments. And if you think of our case, they would come for PET-CT here at the main hospital, and then they would go to MR at uh, Palo Alto or Redwood City. So, you know, traffic is no longer an issue until we get done with this pandemic, but it used to be a big issue to navigate the traffic, find parking, etc. So if anything, even patient convenience is a factor that should be considered. So immediately we, we realized that head and neck cancers are ones where PEMR uh, will be beneficial to patients. Also brain um, tumors, uh, and although non-oncological indications, epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease, we switched all these patients from PET-CT to PEMR once the PEMR was installed at Hoover. And this is an example where same patient image with PET-CT and with PET-MR, and I think you can appreciate the more numerous lymph nodes on both sides when you use the PET-MR than you use the PET-CT, and very good image quality uh, when you do the fusion. There's no motion between the PET and the MR, and at least one series is truly simultaneously acquired between PET and MR, which is something that in PET-CT we don't have because CT is done first, then the table moves and you get the PET-MR. Then we have the pelvic malignancies, in this case, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, and we've been promoting for a while and quite successfully lately the use of PET-MR for patients with ovarian, cervical, rectal cancer. They would get an MR anyway. Sometimes they would get PET-CT, so why not get PET-MR? And this is, this is the algorithm for cervical cancer. And this is an interesting case with a patient with um, cervical cancer. Um, and there was a, a urethral mass, rather, and there were lymph nodes that were called, um, and there was also a possible liver lesion. Uh, by the use of PET-MR, uh, we ruled out one of the lymph nodes as being actually the ovary, and, um, and we, we did evaluate the surgical planning for these patients, and changes were made accordingly. And we ruled out liver metastasis, which um, allowed for the surgical planning for this particular patient. So this was initially called an ovary and was actually a necrotic lymph node. This was a, another uh, enlarged lymph node in the inguinal region. And you can see that simultaneous PET-MR, there's no abnormality to correspond to what was seen on CT in the liver. So this is just one example of many where PET-MR actually has um, impact on patient management on how these patients are addressed. Sarcomas are another group of tumors where MR is done frequently and PET-CT occasionally, so why not do combined PET-MR if you have access to PET-MR? Um, and whether you're talking about bone or superficial or soft tissue, sarcomas, same case, PET-MR should be used if one has access to it. These are images acquired with PET-CT on the left and PET-MR on the right. PET-MR is at least as good as far as PET with PET-CT, but it adds all the information that um, MR brings to the table. So again, no reason not to use PET-MR for these sarcoma patients. This is an example from um, the same case with sarcoma where nothing that was seen on PET-CT is missed on PET-MR. So it's at least non-inferior. But in my opinion, there are many indications where PET-MR is superior to PET-CT for selective uh, malignancies. One issue that, of course, comes to mind is what do you do, particularly for these patients with um, sarcomas, about the detection of 
lung metastasis. Um, well, turns out that there are now sequences and they have been around for a while where UTE, so ultra-fast uh, relaxation time MR sequences allow for detection of the clinically significant uh, nodules, so the ones that are at least four millimeters in size. This is a paper from our colleagues at UCSF. And if there's a high suspicion for uh, pulmonary metastasis, adding a chest CT is pretty straightforward. So our protocol um, uh, for pediatric sarcomas requires them to get a chest CT um, at staging to make sure that there's um, no pulmonary metastasis. And of course, there's the work that Heike is doing um, advocating the use of PEDMR in pediatrics. She's working with quite a few people to achieving a lot of interesting work, including um, the um, lack of uh, contrast. Um, she argues that in many of these cases, there's no need for gadolinium-based uh, contrast. Of course, um, they use uh, ferromoxitol in many of these patients, which is a great blood pool agent, produces beautiful images, but also if you wait long enough, if you image it 24 hours later, uh, it will track to places where iron is deposited, including tumor-associated macrophages. And I think of it as the gallium citrate from the 80s in nuclear medicine, which was good for quite a few malignancies until it was also good for infection, and then it was difficult to use. So this, this is exciting work from Heike's group, and um, look forward to see if truly in pediatric patients you can get away without even using gadolinium-based contrast in PEDMR. But really, the full potential of PEDMR will only be uh, fulfilled once you use tracers beyond FDG. And there is an entire conversation to be had about neuro-PEDMR, including not only FDG, but also amyloid, beta-amyloid, uh, like for beta-band, for beta-peer, uh, neurasic, also tau imaging agents, neuroinflammation agents. So th those conceivably should only be done with PEDMR to take full advantage of the fact that the sum is better than the part. So PET is not as good as PEDMR. MR in many of these indications is not as good as PEDMR. So truly examples of sum is better than the part. We have done in our group for many years um, research proposing the combination of two radiopharmaceuticals in one. So in this, on the left, a man with prostate cancer with FDG, not too contributory in the middle, sodium fluoride, so bone imaging agent, quite a bit of extensive disease in the pelvis and right femur. And if you inject the two together, uh, you don't miss the information from either of them. This was one of the earlier projects where we did this uh, in PEDMR, in selected patients with breast and prostate. We injected both sodium fluoride and FDG. This has to be done from two different syringes because if you mix in one syringe, the FDA will, re will think of it as a new drug and you'll need an IND, but if you inject them sequentially from two syringes, then you can get away with it. And we've noted very uh, low injected doses, so 1.1 on average of sodium fluoride versus 5 to 10 in PET-CT and 4 millicure of FDG versus 10 to 15 in standard PET-CT. So PEDMR uh, reduces radiation exposure not only from substituting CT with MR, but also by in allowing you to inject much less dosage of radio, uh, radio tracer because the PET is so much more sensitive. These are examples where patients, perhaps in an unfair comparison with planar bone scans, got sodium fluoride and FDG PET MR, identifying numerously more lesions, not only in the skeleton, but also in this case, the liver, as well as axillary lymph nodes. This is another example where the MR helps identifying liver metastasis in these patients um, with breast cancer. And yet another example demonstrating more lesions than seen on bone scan uh, in a single exam. So there have been developments um, lately, um, and this is one of them. This has been good for a while, but as I said earlier, and over, radio pharmaceuticals are the way to move forward with uh, prostate cancer and PET-MR. Before we get to that, in neuro-oncology, there is a radio pharmaceutical called fluoroethyltyrosine, FET. This is an amino acid um, targeting agent that is used for gliomas, um, and PET-MR is a perfect indication to use it. There is a chance that it will arrive in the U.S., uh, but until then, uh, fluciclovine, the agent used for prostate cancer, can be used. It's also an amino acid and can be used for uh, detecting uh, gliomas. In fact, it was 
developed for gliomas until they accidentally found some prostate cancers and then they rechanged their, um, they rethought their strategy for bringing it to market. There's more prostate cancer cases, so uh, they got it approved by the FDA for prostate cancer, but it works for gliomas as well. Our group has looked at angiogenesis um, for many years. Uh, of course, angiogenesis is the formation of aberrant blood vessels in tumors and integrin alpha V beta 3. Alpha 5 beta 3 is a marker, a downstream marker of angiogenesis, and we use uh, this uh, agent FPPRGD2, a dimer of arginine glycine and aspartic acid um, in patients with GBM, cervical ovarian cancer. Um, and we published an atlas of this as well. It's an example of a patient with GBM. We did the study where we imaged before Avastin and after one week of Avastin, and this lesion um, in the right frontal lobe was seen with angiogenesis, and the angiogenesis volume decreased as early as one week. And this patient, when they had a significant drop in the volume of angiogenesis, more than 50%, they tend to be long-term survivors versus those with no changes or, or little changes in angiogenesis volume who did not do very well. It's another example. This patient, unfortunately, at one week after Avastin did not have a good response, and six weeks after starting Avastin actually had disease progression. So um, to me, this remains an area of um, very promising science. Angiogenesis is part of many tumors. Um, Avastin, unfortunately, had some bad results, and I think that it had some bad results because beyond phase one, two, it was given to people uh, without proper screening. So not every tumor has angiogenesis. So if you target disease that expresses angiogenesis, yet you don't know if the lesions have angiogenesis, how can you expect the drug to work well? So um, there is some renewed interest in this class of agents, and hopefully that will uh, come back and drive uh, the research that we do uh, in this area. We also evaluated Doratate, and uh, we have PET-CT and pet -MR in this case. These patients, when they have dominant liver disease, they get an elvist mr anyway, so why not do this with pet -MR? And in fact, about a third of our cases at uh, Hoover 2 are Doratate pet -MR for liver-dominant neuroendocrine tumors. So another excellent application of pet -MR. This is another patient. And you can use um, navigation for motion correction of the PET using DMR data to reduce the blurring in these cases. Prostate cancer is one where um, the only things that are recommended as of now in the US are bone scan and choline or axumin PET. However, the world of prostate cancer has been revolutionized by the introduction of prostate-specific membrane antigen. This is our publication um, looking at initial staging of a man with uh, newly diagnosed prostate cancer, intermediate or high risk, prior to prostatectomy. Um, and uh, we've shown that you can very accurately stage them. There was not a single patient uh, who had negative nodal uh, status on PEMR that was found to have not involved by disease on pathology. So perhaps in the future, if you have a negative PMR, you don't have to do extensive pelvic nodal dissection. Very high sensitivity and specificity, and we found more lesions with PMR than with PIRADS MR alone. As you know, PIRADS is very subjective, um, and although uh, hugely forward when it was first introduced, I think that uh, the addition of prostate-specific membrane antigen PET to pelvic MR will greatly improve um, the accuracy of the exam for these patients. These scans are also relatively easy to read. So with PSMA, there's uptake in lacrimal glands, salivary glands, as well as clearance in the gut and by the kidneys into the bladder. But I think that you can appreciate focal uptake below the bladder in the prostate. And we do early and delayed imaging. And you can see that lesion is there. And this um, uh, surgeries are done such that there will be a 3D mold of the prostate that is dealt based on a pre-surgical MR. The prostate is taken out in one block, put in this 3D mold, section stained, and then these stained images showing the cancer are sent to PACS. So afterwards, you can review the pet MR and pathology in conjunction, and clearly here, very nice correlation, the location of the cancer on 
pathology with the focal uptake on PET MR. This is another example, and something else we learned is that sometimes there are suspected one lesion, which perhaps could be amenable to high foo or high dose rate brachytherapy. In this case, we found an additional lesion. And you can see the larger one on pathology, but you can see cancer on the other side. So again, very good correlation um, between PET, MR, and pathology. And there's very interesting work done by people at RSL do, doing um, um, the formable co-registration of PET, MR, and pathology uh, to truly make sure that what you see is uh, correlating nicely with, with the malignancy. There are also work being done to see based on any of the metrics that we can derive from these images about how sooner or how later will recurrence occur. Many of these patients will have recurrence, but do you need to survey them every two months, every three months, et cetera? Maybe we can figure it out based on the pre-surgical imaging. So a lot of interesting work being done. It's another example where there are also lymph nodes in addition to the primary tumor. We also have another tracer in use, RM2. Bombesin, it targets the gas emitting peptide receptor that's also overexpressed in prostate cancer, but also in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. This is funded by the Department of Defense through an award grant. And a few examples just to see how this looks like. Um, in this particular case, uh, the pancreas is the organ that has the highest normal uptake, very minimal hepatobiliary clearance, kidney, ureters, bladder. But below the bladder, you have uptake that was biopsy proven uh, to be prostate cancer, recurrent prostate cancer. So interestingly, in this study, the inclusion criteria are negative CT, negative bone scan, um, negative MR, and rising PSA. So even in this patient population uh, with very tight inclusion criteria, the RM2 PET is positive in about 70% of cases, which is quite a good result. And this is the axial uh, PET MR, if you PET MR of this case, which was biopsy proven to be recurrent prostate cancer. Not only that, this patient underwent high dose rate brachytherapy, and when we scanned later, the signal was gone. So this opens up new opportunities to monitor response to treatment. So instead of these patients having to undergo biopsy to see if there's residual tissue, perhaps imaging will be the way to monitor them. Another example, in this case, tiny perirectal lymph nodes. So this, of course, uh, punts the question back to the referring physician. It used to be that the patients had rising PSA and we could not find it. Now we find it, but what do you do with it? Do you find a brave surgeon who would go and dissect this out? Maybe do you give hormonal chemotherapy, combination with radiation therapy? These are all questions that are unanswered yet, but uh, they will be good topics for future work. This was a patient with a lung nodule that lit up and we saw that maybe it's a, a second malignancy, but it was the only site of recurrence of uh, adenocarcinoma of prostate origin. This was a very interesting case um, where um, there was uptake on the surface of the liver capsule and we didn't know what to make of it. Um, the only site of abnormal uptake and on um, MR, there was nothing at that time. However, on the MR done four months later, done for biopsy guidance, there is tissue enhancement there, and you can see something. Like this was again biopsy proven uh, to represent the only site of biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. So, very interesting results. These are the positivity rates on different PSA quartiles, and of course, the higher the PSA, the higher your positivity rate and chances of finding disease. What's also important is that the PSA velocity is higher in patients with positive scans than in negative scans. So maybe this means that it's okay, we're gonna have some false negatives. Those are the patients with more indolent disease that maybe don't need to be treated too aggressively. So we'll see if this will hold up in, in our current analysis, which has um, 119 patients. We also looked beyond oncology in patients with suspected cardiac sarcoid. FSPG um, is a glutamate analog. Uh, it gets inside cells in the, so the XC transporter. Uh, why we thought of this? Um, well, if you look to evaluate for cardiac sarcoid with FDG, the patient needs to be on a minimum of 12-hour diet. Many times they are unable to follow this diet. Um, and in about a third of the cases, the scan is non-diagnostic or we have to repeat it. So 
it leads to increased cost and radiation exposure. This is our diet, so it's not easy to follow. This uh, patient studied with FSPG, with FDG, um, and the comparison between them, and it showed that actually this tracer is not very good for lung cancer, um, advanced, um, but may be good for sarcoid, and that's why we used it. And this was an equivocal FDG, because when you have diffuse uptake in the heart, that's not a typical partner, pattern for sarcoid, and the FSPG was completely negative. There was also inflammation after hip replacement, and there was minimal uptake there on FSPG, so not FSPG does not light up in every inflammation or infection like FDG does, but more so in granulomatous disease such as sarcoid. And these are transaxial views. Um, and this study continues, and we'll see what kind of results it will have. We also um, use the tracer that are used for evaluation of Alzheimer disease. Um, amyloidosis is usually a systemic disease, so you don't have deposit just in one organ. It's a multi-organ disease. So we wanted to see if we can identify sites of systemic amyloidosis to guide biopsy. We also did all sort of measurements uh, based on MR, on functional MR, and these measurements uh, were nicely correlated with echocardiogram. This is one example where there is intense uptake in the heart immediately that persists on the delayed imaging. So this was typical pattern of cardiac sarcoid. You can appreciate the septal and the lateral walls, typical location. There was also uptake in the, lac in, in the ocular muscles, which is not normal, and this patient on follow-up was found to have uh, visual issues and was sent to ophthalmology. And there was also uptake in the thyroid, which is not normal, and this patient had thyroid function tests that were abnormal. Compared with this patient that had minimal uptake in the heart on immediate images and no uptake on delayed, and so we excluded um, the amyloid um, um, involvement of the heart. However, unknown to the patient, there was diffuse deposition of amyloid plaques in the brain, so he was referred for neurological uh, evaluation. If you want to read more, this is a book that was published a couple of years ago, summarizing the experience uh, with PET-MR in oncology. And this, probably Stanford has the highest concentration of PET-MRs in the worldwide. There's four now on a couple of miles radius. There's the one at Lucas, there's the one um, at Hoover too, there's the one um, at LPCH, and soon, uh, it's already installed at the VA, but soon, hopefully, it will be functional. This was a picture I took in Switzerland um, at the University of Zurich, which is the second site to have had a, a PET-MR uh, after us. Um, and their center is across from a supermarket, so of course the advertisement is for the supermarket, but it was right after under the sign for PET-CTMR. So I always joke that in Zurich, one of the most expensive cities in the world, you can get a PET-CTMR for 50% off, which is obviously not true. It makes for a good joke, I hope. And with that, I thank you, and if you have any questions, happy to take them.